As he left town, James could hardly believe he now owned the hotel he had just slept in the night before. He thought back to earlier that morning when he looked out his hotel room window to see the former investment banker in the funny helmet delivering his transportation to the front entrance. 66 years earlier. Once upon a time, there was an old western town so isolated that it was, for all practical purposes, like a continent unto itself. It looked something like gun smoke, but bigger. Maybe like a little house on the prairie with, let's say, about 10,000 residents in the vicinity and a long one-street business district called Main Street. On a hill at the west end of town, in a humongous white mansion, the largest building in town, lived a big fat man. Let's call him Boss Hogg. Boss Hogg owned about half of all the businesses in town, including the saloon, the bank, the livery, the foundry, and the jail. He was also well known to have the largest stash of gold by far. He made no secret of the fact that he had 22,000 ounces of gold, twice as much as the rest of the town combined. No one knew how Boss Hogg came into so much wealth, but it didn't really matter. For all intents and purposes, Hogg was the effective king of wet and broods. That's the name of the town, by the way. One fine day in July, Boss Hogg called a meeting on the grassy knoll in front of his mansion overlooking Main Street and the sprawling wet and broods. The whole town was in attendance as Hogg had a big announcement to make. He stood there in front of the masses with one large object on his left and a smaller one on his right, both concealed with draped bed linens. As he spoke, Hogg first unveiled the object on his left by pulling the sheet. It was a large printing press. Hogg announced that he had just purchased the finest press in the world, the Green Bend 5000. He went on to explain that he would begin printing new money for the entire town of Wet and Broods. Never again would the town have to worry about a shortage of money every time one of its wealthy residents left for foreign lands with his gold. Boss Hogg himself would provide all the liquid money the town would ever need. The people in the front of the crowd stood up cheering and applauding wildly until their special ed chaperones motioned for them to sit down and put their safety helmets back on. From the back of the crowd, a businessman hollered, Why would we use your money, Hogg? Ah, replied the boss loudly. I knew someone would ask that question. And as he spoke, he jerked the cover off a three-foot pile of gold coins to his right. The crowd in front gasped in amazement at the sight of such shininess and started beating their heads with their fists. My money, proclaimed Hall, shall be redeemable in my gold. Eighteen years later. As the years went by, Boss Hall's paper money became very popular in Wet and Broods. Everyone wanted more and more of it, and just as he had promised, there was never a shortage. Boss Hogg himself amassed almost unbelievable wealth through the success of his money. And incredibly, he was also able to do less hard work in the process. He tore down his magnificent mansion and built an even bigger one. And he bought up other things as well, like the love and adoration of the people. Boss Hogg was living the good life. Now you can call it jealousy or simply an alert eye. But a few businessmen from the east side of town were not as impressed by Hogg as most of the people were. They made note of a few curiosities and gathered together occasionally to discuss them. For one thing, it seemed that everyone in town, including themselves, who was really productive and refused to be lazy, was cashing in their hog bucks for gold. This trend, to the best of their calculations, had already pleaded half of Boss Hogg's gold. They figured Boss Hogg may now own more than half of the town's businesses, but his hoard of gold was probably down to only 11,000 ounces remaining. And this was in a town with maybe 33,000 ounces of gold total. And the other troubling observation was that the entire town, now grown to around 12,000 people, was entirely engrossed in this system of hog bucks. They had literally forgotten that there was ever anything else. This was most disturbing because they realized that with half of his gold gone after only 18 years, there would probably be less than 18 more years until it was all gone. Nine years later. Twenty-seven years after his first meeting, Boss Hogg caught another one. This time he announced that his hog bucks would no longer be redeemable in his gold. Instead, he said they would be redeemable in fancy paper IOUs from he, himself, the richest man in wet and broods, Boss Hogg himself, and that he would print these IOUs on the same Green Bin 5000 that he used to print money. And once again, the helmeted crowd went wild. This time the chaperones were so confused they neglected to calm down their patience. By this time, the group of business owners from the east side of town had given themselves a name. They called themselves the Dukes in honor of their noble old world heritage and values. And at this point, especially after Hogg's new announcement, the Dukes were seriously concerned 
about what would happen to commerce in their town when the rest of Wet and Bruids finally realized what they already knew, that Boss Hogg's hog bucks were nothing more than a Ponzi scheme, only valuable as long as the false confidence in their value persisted. And they began to discuss buying a green bin 5,000 themselves with the thought of launching a redundant backup currency for the purpose of maintaining economic continuity when the hog buck scheme finally failed. To date, the Dukes themselves had accumulated more Boss Hogg's redemption gold than he had left himself. Hogg was down to maybe 8,000 ounces, and the Dukes had about 10,000 ounces between them. The rest of the Bretton Woods, 33,000 ounces of gold, was now widely dispersed among the people of the town. In preparation for the possibility of launching their own currency sometime in the future, the Dukes agreed they would continue to accumulate any gold that anyone in town wanted to sell, even though Boss Hogg was no longer selling what he had left. 25 years later. For two and a half decades, following the closing of Hogg's Gold Window, the town of Wet and Broods grew more and more acclimated to using his unbacked money. Those that still wanted gold traded it for hog bucks amongst themselves, and for 25 years, the roughly 15,000 ounces of gold in general circulation seemed to suffice. Sometimes the price of this free gold would spike upward, and other times it would fall. Meanwhile, the Dukes found it increasingly difficult to accumulate more gold without causing the price to spike. With Hogg's gold window open at a fixed price, they had accumulated 10,000 ounces for 27 years. Now in 25 years, they had only added another 1,000 ounces between them. But they also noticed an interesting secondary effect. With the price of free gold rising 1,000% in 25 years, so too did the value of their gold hoard. So while they were only able to add 10% more physical gold, their overall wealth went up more than tenfold during that same time frame. This was a curious development for the Dukes, and because they were not flashy with their wealth the way Boss Hogg was with his, it went largely unnoticed by anyone but the Dukes themselves. The Dukes consisted of Bo the stagecoach builder, Luke the tannery owner, Uncle Jesse who owned the local food diner, and Daisy who entertained the visitors that came to Bretton Woods. Sweet, sweet Daisy. And for the first time in decades, the Dukes could see clearly what they needed to do for the good of the community. They had already ordered their own Green Bin 5000, which was being shipped, and now they had a plan for their new currency. If they wanted it to perform as a failsafe for the wet and broods economy, they would have to correct the flaws in Hogs Hog Bucks that had become very apparent to the Dukes. The first flaw, which was apparent to the Dukes 34 years earlier, was Boss Hogg's original gold exchange strategy. By comparing the first 27 years of redeemable Hog Bucks to the last 25 years of unbacked Hog Bucks, the solution became clear. As long as Boss Hogg was redeeming his money with his gold, the flow of gold was one direction only, out, and relatively quick. Hogg had lost 14,000 ounces of gold in 27 years, and the Dukes had found it quite easy to accumulate 10,000 ounces themselves during that time. But ever since Hogg's exchange policy was ended and the price of gold floated, the flow of gold was many directional, making it much more difficult to accumulate a large hoard. The second flaw, and perhaps the more important one, was clearly visible in Boss Hogg's own flashy ways. For 52 years now, Hogg had grown more and more fat and lazy. He had sold off most of his businesses in town, and he now seemed to rely solely on his Green Bin 5000 for maintaining his flamboyant lifestyle. The common people in town hardly noticed, but the Dukes being business owners themselves could see that with each increase in his own lifestyle, Boss Hogg was diluting the value held by everyone else in town. In fact, the only compensation the Dukes realized, the only relief from Boss Hogg's personal profligacy they found was in the tenfold rise in the value of the gold they had redeemed from Hogg in the early days. In addition to these two glaring flaws, the Dukes also noticed a couple other subtle changes in Boss Hogg's money management strategy. Ever since he had given up real work in order to focus solely on the maintenance of public confidence in his Ponzi scheme, the first had to do with his fancy paper IOUs. 25 years earlier, Hogg had replaced his gold exchange window with an IOU window. This IOU window had been so successful that Hogg literally gave up all productive work just to keep up with demand for his paper IOUs. Part of the reason for their popularity was that Boss Hogg would date each IOU for some time in the future. And the farther off the date, the more money he would promise as a kicker on the IOU at maturity. So the people of Wet and Broods were literally lining up for these high-paying IOUs. Some of the helmeted ones even laughed at the fact they had ever wanted gold from the same window without any time-related kicker. 
The best part for Boss Hall was that he never had to deliver anything real to these people that held IOUs. The more productive people that were earning plenty of hog bucks would just exchange their mature IOUs for fresh ones with new dates and new kickers. And in this way, they watched their savings grow. This was Hogg's most popular slogan, watch your savings grow. For the people that couldn't roll over their IOUs, Hogg would just print them up some fresh hog bucks, further diluting the wealth of the town. And no one except the Duke seemed to notice. And finally, for the people in town that were so poor they couldn't even afford Hogg's IOUs, he started a very special program. He called this program Change You Can Believe In. And he taught these people how to issue their own IOUs directly to him in exchange for fresh hog bucks. This was a troubling development. The second change in Hogg's Ponzi management strategy was even more interesting to the Dukes. Hogg had apparently noticed the rise in the overall value of his remaining gold hoard. The same development the Dukes had noticed. But unlike the Dukes, who saw this as a positive result, Boss Hogg apparently saw it as a threat to his IOU business. What he had found with a simple calculator was that the rise in value of his gold actually kept up pretty well with his Watch Your Savings Grow program and actually surpassed it at times. It seemed to the Dukes that Boss Hogg was afraid other people in town would notice the simple math and that they would then start to question what real things they would ever be able to buy with their IOUs down the road. Perhaps they'd find it smarter to take something real now that would rise in value rather than an IOU with a Ponzi kicker. Anyway, Hogg decided to do something about it he wanted to flood the wet and Brood's gold market with his significant gold supply in order to sink the price and conceal the math. But he didn't want to part with the ownership of any more of his gold. So he came up with a brief scheme to loan his gold to the town bank, which would then sell it into the Bretton Woods marketplace, flooding supply and lowering the price. And the best part was that the bank would still own the gold back to Boss Hogg at some point in the future. Years earlier, Hogg had sold the bank to the chaperones, who now staffed it with helmet heads because banking is so easy, even a caveman can do it. So the Dukes now realized what they needed to do. They had identified the two principal flaws in the hog buck's design as well as two Achilles heel and Boss Hogg's Ponzi management strategy. In creating their Dukes currency, they simply had to design the flaws right out of it and then pretend to engage in and encourage the most unsustainable elements of Hogg's strategy, IOU proliferation, and buying up his lint gold from the helmet kids. Five years later, Dukes now circulated alongside the hog buck. Of course, Boss Hog had not been happy when he found out another Green Bim 5000 was in town. But there wasn't much he could really say out loud about it since his own scheme was quite precarious in its maturity. Almost everyone in town now held their savings and their debt in IOUs denominated in hog bucks, but no one yet held IOUs denominated in the new Dukes. So Boss Hogg rightfully feared that any exposition of his Ponzi scheme might panic the people of Bretton Woods to attempt redemption in Dukes because they didn't carry the baggage of all that debt. Meanwhile, the Dukes themselves had begun issuing IOUs denominated in hog bucks and even using some of those barred hog bucks to buy some of Hogg's lint gold from the bankers and helmets. Quite a game, really. Even Boss Hogg himself didn't catch all the nuance in it. Also around this time, some other curious developments emerged which posed an even greater threat to expose Hogg's Ponzi scheme. The boss had long ago convinced the people of Wet and Brews that he would no longer print hog bucks specifically for his own indiscriminate spending habits. Instead, he explained to the masses his income now relied solely on his booming IOU business, which brought in a healthy flow of old hog bucks for his spending pleasure. But over the last few years, it seemed that everyone in town was issuing their own IOUs ever since Boss Hogg taught them all how to do it. And now those townsfolk IOUs were circulating like hot potatoes among the people squashing the demand for Hogg's own IOUs. More and more frequently, he found himself late at night printing up new hog bucks under the cover of darkness and buying his own IOUs from himself just to have some spending cash. Another frightening development for Hogg was that he had lent nearly all of his gold to the bank and now the price was once again rising. So feeling the heat of these two new threats, Boss Hogg arranged a meeting with his buddies at the bank, and together they hatched a new scheme to bring in a fresh stream of income. Their scheme entailed opening a new side business at the bank. They literally opened a new window on the side of the building with their heads and called it a ride-through window. But this new side business was more like a casino than a bank. 
What Hogg and his challenge friends were selling were bets on whose IOUs in town would fail the confidence test first. Of course, he had to take bets against his own IOUs, but because he would be printing the winnings himself, this didn't concern him much. Also, he gave three of the slowest bankers the job of rating everyone's IOUs in town to assist in setting the odds for the casino. They were instructed to rate everyone against Boss Hogg's own IOUs, which would always carry the highest rating. Seven years later. Now there's something I forgot to tell you about the Dukes. Years earlier, when they first introduced their new currency, they too held a meeting for everyone on the east end of town. And at that meeting, Bo gave a speech in which he laid out for the townsfolk just how the Duke's currency would be different than the hog buck. Here's a bit of that speech. What is money? Economists know that money is defined by the functions it performs as a means of exchange, a unit of account, and a store of value. But, just as importantly, money is also defined by the community for whom it performs these functions. Because it is an economic instrument for each of its users, it is also a political and cultural bond between them. Consider this simple fact. We engage in an exchange of goods and services every day by using money as the means of exchange. And we offer our labor in exchange for money, which in itself has no value. We only do this because we believe that we will, in turn, be able to exchange that money for more goods or services. This fact tells us much about the confidence that we place in money itself. And it tells us much more about the confidence that we place in each other. Hence, money is, in essence, a social contract. The Duke, much more than the hog buck, represents the mutual confidence at the heart of our community. It is different from the hog buck in that it will never be linked to gold, thereby suppressing the value of your gold savings on the free market. But it also will never be linked to the benefit or enrichment of any single member of our community above another. It is not backed by the durability or weakness of any other thing, nor by the authority of a single fat man. Indeed, what Sir Thomas More said of gold 500 years ago, that it was made for men, and that it has value by them, applies very well to the Duke. Now back to the story. It's about this time that Boss Hogg's Ponzi scheme reached the pinnacle of its complexity and instability. His casino bet receipts now circulated along with IOUs, Hog Bucks, and Dukes. But the bet receipts numbered more than 10 times the amount of IOUs. And there were also more than 10 times as many IOUs as Hog Bucks. Doing the simple math, that's 100 times as many bets as hog bucks. So what began decades earlier as a simple Ponzi scheme had morphed into a very large upside-down pyramid scheme, bouncing ever so precariously on its point. It wouldn't take much to trigger collapse, and in fact it didn't. The way it actually played out is still being analyzed to this day, and probably will be for many years to come. But basically what happened was an interconnected collapse of confidence as Hogg's own IOU rating crew inadvertently exposed his own system's weakness in no uncertain terms. What followed was months of social and economic pandemonium and chaos. But somehow, Hogg seemed to get it back under control by running his Green Bend 5000 24-7 and quantitatively easing the debt woes of wet and broods by airdropping hog bucks from his hot air balloon. Curiously, though, he wasn't so kind to the Dukes on the east side of town. Two years later, Poor Daisy ran into a rough patch. What with the pandemonium and all, her tourism business had a tough couple of years. As it turned out, she had engaged in Boss Hogg's IOU and casino system the most of any of the Dukes by issuing too many IOUs of her own. She had issued them denominated in both Hog Bucks and Dukes. And now she didn't have enough Hog Bucks or Dukes to pay off her debt. Old Hogg jumped on this opportunity to not only discredit the Dukes as a group, but their paper Dukes as well. But unlike Hogg and his helmet heads, the Dukes had vowed not to print their Dukes for the benefit of individuals. This seemed to amplify Daisy's problems, especially when Boss Hogg publicly mocked the Dukes for their short-sighted policy of no bailout printing. Of course, Daisy still had all of her gold. She wasn't so foolish as to sell it at a low price, or worse, to loan it to the Banker Brigade. So the Dukes held a meeting in private to discuss their options. It was clear that Boss Hogg's ridiculous system was coming to an end. But how should the Dukes deal with Daisy's debt crisis? When they emerged from their meeting, the Dukes announced that Daisy's debt problems would be quantitatively eased, 
Boss Hogg laughed out loud, shouting to the whole town that the Dukes had sold out, that they were no better than him. But after the announcement, the Dukes just went back inside quietly, confident in the knowledge that it would all soon be over. Sometime later, James, the first tourist to visit Wet and Broods in two years, on a tip from his lovely hostess, Daisy, whom he had paid with gold for a night of excellent, excellent hospitality, also paid for his hotel room with gold, receiving the kicker of the deed for the entire hotel itself. Included in this kicker was the hotel's seemingly insurmountable debt owed to Boss Hogg, which was the reason James got it. And as such, the gold paid at the front desk flowed directly back to Boss Hogg himself, extinguishing the debt. And for the first time in weeks, Hogg and his band of merry but hungry ex-bankers ate very well at Uncle Jesse's diner. Oh, and after paying for the feast with gold, Boss Hogg happily took his change in Dukes. The end. City where the grass is green and the girls are pretty Won't you take me home Take me down to the paradise city where the grass is green and the girls are pretty Won't you take me home Just a urchin living under the street I'm a hard case that's tough to beat I'm your charity case so buy me something to eat I'll pay you at another time Rags to riches or so they say You gotta keep on pushing for the fortune and fame It's a gamble when it's just a game You treat it like a capital crime Everybody's doing their time Now take me down to the paradise city Where the grass is green and the girls are pretty Oh, won't you take me home Take me down to the paradise city where the grass is green and the girls are pretty. Won't you take me home? Cigarette, but I can't see. Tell me who you're gonna believe. Captain America's torn apart. He's a poor jester with a broken heart. Turn me around, take me back to the start. I must be losing my mind. I've seen it all a million times. Take me down to the paradise city where the grass is green and the girls are pretty. Won't you take me home? down to the paradise city where the grass is green and the girls are pretty won't you please take me home take me down to the paradise city where the grass is green and the girls are pretty won't you take me home take me down to the paradise city where the grass is green and the girls are pretty Where the grass is green and the girls are pretty